So today um, you are automatically muted and your camera is off. Uh, this will this is being recorded. It will be on the Ndow YouTube channel. Um, so you can go back and look at it if you want to over again. Please use the Q&A tab to ask questions. I love lots of questions. You can either use the chat down here or the Q&A here um, so that we can see your questions. And uh, the moderators will let me know if I miss something and we'll go ahead and answer any questions we can for you. If uh, again, like I said earlier, there uh, will, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I've, I've been fishing for probably 55 years and I still find out things I get asked questions I don't know the answer to. So, so feel free to jump up and let us know if you got a question. And then at the end of it, I'll open up the chat for audience participation um, and, and feel free to, uh, to add stuff to it. Um, so first off, we're just this is basic gear is what it's about. And uh, not, nothing fancy. I'm not going into fly fishing or anything like that. This is for the person who is just getting started fishing, wants to know what's going on. And so uh, we'll try and get you that way. And so for fishing rods, probably the easiest and simplest rod you can buy is a cane pole. They're generally around 10 or 12 feet. It's basically two or three pieces, sometimes four pieces. It's nothing more than a long piece of bamboo. You tie a string on the end of it with a bobber uh, hook and maybe some weights, a little bit of bait, and you're ready to go fishing at your local urban pond. You know, they're really inexpensive. Um, this is what I started with as a kid. Uh, I used to fish canals in Florida at my grandparents' house, but we also fished a lot of really small ponds that had things. This is perfect for panfish, um, fish like bluegill, crappie, perch, that kind of stuff. And generally the string is only as long as the pole, otherwise you can't really control it very well. The prices of them started at about five bucks and they go up from there. Yes, you can get some uh, synthetic gear made. Uh, some of these made out of graphite or things like that. And they get a little bit pricey. And some of those nice long ones will actually telescope down. Um, you can buy them uh, online or at your local uh, local sporting goods store. And so cane poles, if you got kids and you, you're on a budget, it really is a great, great way to get started, especially if you're just going down to your local little urban ponds and that will get them get them going. Um, you don't have to worry about about reels getting tangled up or anything like that. Um, I'll still I, I still use these uh, every once in a while something similar to this on on our very small streams up here in northern Nevada um, because you you have total control of your line. You're feeling your presentation and some of our small creeks and streams up here in Elko, uh, White Pine counties. Um, these work great on. Uh, spin casting rods. This is probably the next easiest one for people to use. As you can see, it's uh, got kind of a pistol grip of a handle. Um, it extends out. They'll range anywhere in length from about three and a half feet up to about six and a half, seven feet. And so that's a great way to get started. Um, the nice thing about these, I'm going to come back to camera here for a second. Um, I can't tell. Am I up, Abby? I can't see myself. So anyway, the great thing about these, um, the, the the line is enclosed inside here. And so with this line enclosed, a lot less tangling. When you go to cast, you put your trigger finger underneath the finger grip. You push this, rot, this lever down, and then you hold it down until you actually cast, and then you let it up. That's the best way to do it. Again, you, you hold it down like that. And when you go to cast, that's when you let it go. And then when you start to reel, it tightens it up and brings your line in. Uh, the great thing about these, like I said, is that they really don't cause a whole lot of um, issues with, uh, with, with tangling. Though I will say if they do get tangled, you got to take this top off. And sometimes they can, you don't realize they are getting tangled when they do. And so it can be a lot worse. Um, that's 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 the spinning reel. I'm seeing. Did I see some chat in there? Somebody got some questions. Um, uh, Can you see do here. That one more time. Someone said that they couldn't see you. Okay. So what we have up here. This is the, the this is a spin casting reel. Um, these are really good for use with uh, uh, for for kids. This is what I use in all of my kids' fishing clinics up here in the northeastern Nevada. And the great thing about this, it's enclosed. So it keeps kids from tangling up. The, the use of it is very, very easy. Basically just pushing this button down 
And then when you go to cast, you let go of the button and the line comes out like that. And then when you go ahead and start reeling it in, it tightens it back up and it's all done automatically inside. Um, it's got a lever on the right hand side. This is made to be on top. Uh, if you're left handed, you can set it back. You can re flip the handle over so that you reel with your left hand. Um, if you like to cast with your right, normally with your right handed, you cast with your right hand, switch over and then reel with your right, but you can set it up the other way. Very simple, um, an outfit like this, uh, they start as inexpensive as about $10, $12. Honestly, if you can afford it, I'd get up in the $25 range. It makes a big difference on the, uh, uh, on, on, especially on the, on the, the, uh, the reel. Um, to give you an idea how long some of these things last, this reel is about 10 years old, but this fishing rod that I have here, this is from when I was about 12 years old. So that if you take good care of your gear, it'll still use my grandkids still fish with this quite a bit. So, so that's, that's the, the spinning gear uh, or spin casting gear. Now, if we go to uh, our, uh, the, the next one is a spinning rod. It's a little bit differently different. Your reel actually is underneath the rod. You'll have your eyes on the bottom. And as you can see here, your, your eyes are going to be pointing down. The, that, these are the guides that your line goes through. Your, your reel sits inside the reel seat, your hand over here, and you can see it's got a bail on it. And so this bail will allow you is, is what actually helps you hold the line on. A little more complicated to use. Um, if you take this, I've got another one right here. So, so the way this works right here, when you get ready to use it, you're holding it. I generally hold it in between my, right in the middle of my four fingers. You will pull the bail back. You then grab the line um, underneath your finger. And as you go to cast, you let go with your line on the forward part of the cast. This comes out. And then when you go to reel it in, it closes that bail and tightens the line up. So again, you pull this bail back with your hand, put it underneath your, your, your forefinger. And then when you go to cast, you let go on the forward part of the cast. And then as you turn the handle, it'll close that bail and then it tightens up. The downside to these, a little more complicated for kids to use. Um, take a little bit of practice on the timing. Both of them actually take a little practice on the timing. They they do uh, get tent, it can get a little bit tangled easier because you're, it's open for you to see what's going on. At the same time though, you know when you get tangled right away because you can see it. Um, I'll use these with adult clinics or with older children, you know, junior high, high school age. But if you're dealing with elementary school children, um, things like that, I really prefer those spin casting reels. They're much simpler and easier to use. The other thing that you have to be careful of on these, there's a lever on the back right here. And what that does, it'll if you push it, pull it backwards, it'll allow you to go backwards. Um, it'll allow you to unreel it backwards. And that's when you start getting tangled. So what I'll do if I'm doing kids, I'll actually take hot glue and close this. And there's another on some of those spin casting reels, there is a little lever you can switch to let you un unwind it with, with the, the, uh, the handle. Again, when you start doing that unwinding without any pressure on it, it causes problems. So again, on, on the, if it's got a lever for that on the spin casting reel, I just take a little drop of hot glue and, and make it so the kids can't switch it over. It saves a lot of headaches later on. Um, so... So, so that's, those are the two, three basic types. I'm not going to go into fly rods. That's much more specialized. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a lot more stuff. These particular spinning, spinning rods, you can generally buy them starting at about $15, but I would recommend uh, again, getting up into the, uh, getting up into that more expensive, uh, expensive stuff, get up to that $25 range. In the long run, you'll have a whole lot of uh, more pleasure. It'll last a whole lot longer. And, and so that's, 
it's worth that extra outlay if you can afford it. If you can't, you know, those 10 to $15 spin casting rods and spinning rods will work to get you started to get you out fishing, especially if you're hitting some of those uh, small urban ponds where, where distance isn't as uh, casting isn't as big a deal. The one thing I would stay away from the kids really like those small little uh, three foot Snoopy rods, Mickey Mouse rods, uh, the, the, the little, uh, cartoon type rods, they tend to be made really cheaply. And, and I, and, and even though I've bought them in the past, I try to stay away from them. They, they do, uh, they, they do end up breaking down and, and there's nothing worse than getting the kids out fishing or yourself out fishing, having the gear break down. And, and, you, you know, you, you drove a, an hour to, uh, to get to, to where you're fishing or a half hour to get where you're fishing, you spend 15 minutes fishing and something breaks. Um, so to me, often your gear may seem like a lot of money when you're first starting, but it does um, pay for itself in the long run. And when you take into account your time, fuel, um, all that other stuff, it really is a, not that much. Um, and so let's talk fishing line next. For the most part, six to eight pound monofilament is good for most fishing situations in Nevada. And I'm talking just general panfish, trout, um, even small catfish, uh, bass, that kind of stuff. If you're starting to get to the point where you have bigger fish, then you've got to start getting into your, your larger or, or heavier line. Um, and again, monofilament does deteriorate over time. A couple things to, to consider with your monofilament. Um, most fishermen will replace it every spring before they go out. I generally, you know, in the fall, um, I'll winterize my gear. I'll go ahead and clean out my reels, uh, take my, you know, and, 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 clean up the, the rods, all that kind of stuff, go through my tackle box, clean things off. And, and at that time, and then in the spring, what I'll do is take the line off before I go fishing and put brand new monofilament on. Something that people don't realize, monofilament will absorb water. And when it absorbs water, it actually loses some of its strength. It lo can lose up to 20% of its strength. So if you have 10 pound test, and you, it's gotten wet most of the summer, obviously in the water, it's going to get wet and it absorbs that water. Now it's only eight pound test because it has lost up to 20% to of its strength. Um, the other thing is look at, uh, I like the limper lines and you can, when you look at the boxes, um, it'll tell you whether it's limp or not. And the nice thing about that, that limp stuff is, is it straightens out easier, it casts easier, and, and also in under cold water conditions, um, ends up handling better as well. There is a line called fluorocarbon. It's very expensive. It's pretty specialized. Um, for the same diameter of line, it's actually not, not nearly as strong as monofilament. And for the beginner, monofilament at about seven to fifteen dollars a, a, a spool is, is well. It works just fine. In fact, when you buy your uh, your kits, like your uh, your spinning rod or your or your spin casting rod as a kit, they often come already spooled with line. So your first year, you're generally pretty good to go. Um, Next thing, we've got to have hooks. So size eight or 10 hooks are good for most trout and panfish situations. This is a picture of a typical um, typical bait hook. If you look at it, you'll see it has a barb on the back side of the hook up here on the, uh, the, the shank of the hook. There's a couple little barbs. And then obviously off right behind the point, there's a barb to help hold the fish onto the uh, keep the fish from slipping off of the hook. These barbs on the backside here are often made primarily to, to hold you, help hold your bait on. Um, and, and now if you're starting to get in catfish or bass, you might, you're might you going to start looking at larger hook sizes. Um, two through eight generally will handle most situations. Um, I've caught uh, eight, 10 pound catfish and bass on like a number two or a number four hook. The big thing to remember, the hook is the point that's actually contacting the fish. And this point um, can get dull. So a small little file or, a, or even a nail file to touch it up and get it a little bit sharper after you've caught a couple fish is definitely worth it. The other thing is if you buy really cheap hooks, sometimes they'll straighten out or bend. And with most trout, or panfish in our area, um, especially in our urban ponds and, and stuff, 
generally, you know, you're not going to catch those really large five to 10 pound trout that'll uh, uh, pull your, pull your, your, your hook out. But I've actually caught um, trout up to 10 pounds on really small hooks fly fishing. We're talking uh, size 16, 18, even 20 hooks, which are really tiny, very small. And so it's not always the size of the hook, but the quality of the hook that'll, that'll help you with your stuff. Um, bobbers. So, so this is the most common bobber that people use. It's a red and white bobber. Abby showed you how to hook your line onto it earlier. Uh, they're really good for most common situations. They're easy to see. Uh, they have enough weight to them to cast. Um, they're great for most bait fishing situations. And, and so, so these are great. Kids like them. They're inexpensive. Often you can buy uh, two or, you know, often they're 25, 50 cents a piece, depending on the size of them. Uh, you can buy a package of say half a dozen uh, three quarter inch bobbers, which is a real nice size or one inch bobbers, nice size for under two bucks. Then you have your clear bobber, bobbers and the line goes through the middle here. The, 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 your, you, you have to thread your line through the middle and you can fill this up with water. Got a little ahead of myself here. Fill this up with water, gives it a little late, a little bit of uh, a weight. So for making casting, I will often use this uh, if I'm just casting some really light uh, bait without a without a uh, uh, a sinker on it. If I'm if I'm dead drifting things like grasshoppers or uh, uh, crickets through a through a small creek run, these are really good for that. Um, they're also really good if you're uh, got kids that. Uh, are, you're using flies, you're catching fish on flies. They don't know how to fly fish. Um, put about three feet of, uh, uh, of leader out behind, below it, uh, tie a swivel. Of course, the swivel stops this, this um, bobber from going up and down. The little, you fill it about half full of water to give it some weight, but so, not so much weight that it sinks. And you can fly fish with this uh, really easily. Lots of fun to do. And then these balsa wood bobbers on the right hand side over here. They're really uh, uh, high floaters. Um, they're very, very sensitive. A lot of people will use these uh, on, on, uh, on rivers where you can see them. They stick out of the water as it's floating down a stream, especially if you get where there's a little bit of turbulence, a little bit easier to see. You can see that the top of it is that chartreuse color. And the other thing to remember, different color bobbers will work differently in different um, light conditions. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes orange will work better. Uh, white often in low light conditions doesn't work very well. You can't differentiate it. So a fluorescent orange or that chartreuse will work really well to make it a whole lot easier to see. Okay. Sinkers. So the, the most common type people use are split shot, just like this. They come in a variety of sizes. My personal opinion is the, the lighter the sinker you can use, the better off you are. Um, so, so yes, sinkers can help you really cast far away, but if it pulls your bobber underneath, it makes it a lot harder to, to see your bobber. Um, if, if it's, uh, uh, it, there's also other times where if you put too much on when, and especially with the split shot, when the fish go to take your, your bait, the, uh, uh, the, the, the split shot gets stuck either in some rocks or some vegetation. And so, um, especially when it, you put, you know, three or four of them on, make it really heavy. I've seen people do that all the time. If you can get by with that, with just one, that's great. If you got to put a couple on, that's fine also. But if you got to put more than, you know, two, two on, I would go to a bigger size sinker. Generally, you can get a box of, or a bag of about 20 of these for about two or three dollars, relatively inexpensive. There are some states uh, such as California, if you go to, you cannot use lead sinkers. You have to use lead free. Um, generally, they're made of, a, of a, like tin or, or some tin, uh, some alloy that includes tin in it, um, bismuth. Um, but then you start getting more expensive when it's lead-free sinkers. Um, another type sinker is the egg slinker. We also call these slip sinkers. You run your line through that hole. You can see there's a, uh, a hole through the end of the sinkers. And that goes all the way through. That goes all the way through and you run your line through it. Then you either put a small piece of split shot um, on the hook side of the sinker, uh, however far you want it from the hook, or you tie on a uh, swivel. And then from the swivel, you can put a little bit of leader and then put your hook on uh, your, uh, 
depending on how far you want it to go. And the great thing about this, um, you run your line through it. If it's sitting on the bottom and a fish picks up your bait, um, it, it actually, your, your line slides through without being stopped. So the fish doesn't really feel any resistance. You just got to pay attention a little bit to your to the tip of your pole. And so by letting it slide through without resistance, it often makes it uh, um, more likely the fish will continue to take your bait um, with, with the, and, and have a much better chance of catching that fish. Again, those, those sinkers are about the same price as the, uh, as the split shot. They're a little bit larger. So you'll get like 10 or 12 instead of 20, 25 of them in a package for about two, two to three bucks. Other equipment, once you catch a fish, it's a lot easier to get out of the water if you got a net. I've seen a lot of people lift a fish up. The small pan fish, not a big deal. But if you uh, get a little bit bigger trout, say, you know, a two pound trout, one and a half, two, sometimes even three pound trout and uh, or a catfish or a bass and the line is nicked a little bit, which makes it a weak point. If you try to just lift it straight out of the water, sometimes that line breaks and you lose your fish. Nobody wants to do that, especially your, your children want to have success. So let them, uh, uh, you know, get the, have that have that 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 basic uh, uh, net. Um, again, please, people, feel free to ask any questions you have. Um, I tend to run on, so don't be afraid to stick your hand up or or go use a Q&A or the chat to let us know. The thing about these nets, you can buy really inexpensive ones. They've got a nylon basket. That's this. This is the basket down here. Um, the problem with some of those nylon baskets, they'll they'll actually wipe the slime off the outside of the fish. And when you wipe that slime off, it does several things. One, that slime actually acts as a lubricant to let them uh, fish or swim quicker through the water, which will uh, allow them to escape predators. The other thing that slime does, it acts as a barrier to keep bacteria and diseases out. And so, yes, you can buy one with one of those really harsh nylon nets for about six, seven, eight bucks. But, but spend uh, about 20, 22 bucks, get one with a rubberized net and it'll, it'll be much friendlier to your fish, especially if you're practicing catch and release. And of course, this one um, has an extendable handle. Uh, many of them just have a very short, you know, 10, 10 inch, one foot handle. Others will have handles up to three feet on them. Um, and if you're fishing from a boat or if you've got water that's really much, very low below your, uh, your feet, you're fishing off of dock or something, you may want that longer handled one. Uh, once you get the fish in, you got to get that hook out of its mouth. And so a pair of those pliers or a set of hemostats will allow you to do that. Um, you go down, you, don't, you grab the hook and you just kind of twist, uh, twist that hook out of the mouth. You can leave the fish in the net, even in the water, if you're going to release it um, while you do that. Uh, earlier, Abby was talking about a uh, multi-purpose tool, and those are really great also. They also give you the option of doing some other things. The great thing about the uh, needle nose pliers and the, and the hemostats, they're relatively inexpensive. You can buy needle nose pliers at just about any hardware store, starting about seven, eight bucks. The one thing I would do is I would uh, tie a piece of, uh, you know, attach them to a lanyard or a piece of rope that you can tie off to, to yourself. So if you drop them in the water, you don't lose them. Um, and so these will, the, uh, the needle nose, like I said, you can start about six, seven bucks. The uh, uh, hemostats, again, at, at a lot of fishing stores, uh, outdoor stores, you can catch, uh, they start at between five and seven dollars and go up from there. Once you have the fish, if you're going to keep it, you need something to put it on so you don't lose it. And so you get a stringer. This is an inexpensive stringer. Uh, generally, they're about six feet long. They're, they're very easy to use. Uh, you run this, this point here um, through, the, through the gill and out through the mouth and then run it through the, the loop here. And that will allow, um, then you just poke the, the this pointed edge part here, the pin part into the ground or tie it off to your boat or the dock. And then you can leave the fish in the water. Um, another type of stringer is, is one like this where you can hook one fish up to each link in the chain. You can see these, these big snaps here and each one of those will hold a fish. Um, you can see it comes out. You put that through the, a lot of times this will go right under, you know, in a trout, you can put it up underneath the, the, uh, 
through the through the bottom jaw and out the mouth, or again through the the gills and out the mouth. Once you use a stringer, though, the fish can't be released. You've damaged the fish enough that if you release it, its chances of survival are, are very, very, very small. And then finally, you know, for cutting fishing line and stuff, a little set of nippers work really great. Um, for years, I used really inexpensive fingernail clippers. You can buy them at, at any any department store anywhere. Um, this one, notice, has a has a little bead chain at the end. Again, attach it to a lanyard. Um, put the lanyard around your neck, and that way you 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 have it readily at hand. Um, and and so that when you need it, you've got it. When you're tying hooks on or or lures on, being able to nip that tag in off very quickly. Please don't use your teeth. Um, I have two front teeth that they've had to rebuild up because cutting fishing line with my teeth caused them to get chipped. Not very fun at all. Also a little expensive too. So you got to be able to carry some of your fishing gear. You know, it can be really inexpensive. You can get these clear plastic boxes at just about any department store for around five bucks. Um, put some hooks in there, some sinkers. Uh, you, you put your bobbers in there. If you go buy some some spinners or some small inexpensive lures to begin with, then, then it's got room for that. Your stringer will fit in there. Really easy to carry quite a bit of gear. And these, yeah, they're, they're, you got to make sure that they're latched closed and they're not real sturdy. So if you step on them or, or somebody puts something heavy on them, they can break. But for if you're just getting started and need something, or you can actually get, you know, two or three or four of these. Um, in one of them, you can put your soft plastic grubs or worms. In another, you put your hooks and sinkers. In another, you can put your spinners and Rapalas, that kind of stuff. So, so that, that's really good stuff to use. Um, very inexpensive way to get started. Of course, you've got your regular tackle boxes that when you open up, they have trays. Um, they'll generally start at about 12, 13 bucks uh, for the inexpensive ones. And believe me, they do go up from there. I've got a few that are, that are quite pricey, but, but like I said, uh, other than my family and travel, fishing's about what I do with, with most of my time. And, and so I've, I've been fishing for a long time and, and like that. In fact, these also really good. You can see, you know, they're divided, they're divided here so that uh, you can, um, put different things in different parts and have it really well organized. One thing that I make it a point to do is about, you know, every few fishing trips, I end up getting disorganized. So I, the night before I'm going to go the next time, I'll take a few minutes and go through it. And then of course, at the end of the year, when I'm done fishing for the year for the winter, um, which I know you in Vegas people, that's when you're just getting started. But up here when it, uh, it got down to five degrees last night at my house. So we're getting close to where we start getting ice on the water. Um, I'll go through and completely clean it out, um, empty it totally, maybe uh, hit it with a little bit of soap and water, let it air dry, and then put my gear back in and reorganize it. You can also carry your fishing gear in a fishing vest. Generally, these start at about 30, 35 bucks. I think you can buy some of the uh, uh, lower end ones at about 20, 25 bucks at some of our, our department stores. And again, same thing as with the others, you've got a lot of different pockets to put things in. You know, here you've got two little pockets plus a big pocket, another pocket behind that, you've got that there. Most of them have a little Velcro patch up here that you can put a piece of foam on there to stick hooks and flies or lures in. Um, this one's made with netting for, for when it's hot out. They also come with uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, they also come with solid cloth. Um, and then of course, uh, some will even come built onto a personal flotation device so that you can, um, it, it doubles as a, as a life jacket for when you're in your boat and on the water. So what do we use for bait? The most, you know, one of the most common baits everybody uses is worms. Um, they work really slick. Uh, they're, they're, they're inexpensive. The downside, they don't last very long. Uh, what we do up here, my, uh, my family, we have a compost pile. And when we're done fishing, we put the worms in the compost pile. And literally after just a month or two in the compost pile, many of them have reproduced so much now, we don't even go buy worms. We just go turn a shovel over in the bottom of the compost pile and we get all the worms we want. Um, mule worms are really good. Uh, oh, by the way, you can get the, the night crawlers are quite large. Um, you've also got uh, what they call, you know, they've got uh, smaller night crawlers, they got different sizes. And then they have red wigglers. 
Um, for pan fish, I like to use the smaller worms. If I'm using a night crawler, I'm generally actually just pinching a piece off of it to put on the hook. You can buy them at a lot of uh, a lot of uh, convenience stores or gas stations. As you're heading out, a lot of them, will, especially if they're near fishable waters, at least up here in, in Elko County, almost all the gas stations carry them. Um, you can also find them at, you know, any of your sporting goods stores or, or sporting goods departments in your department stores as well. Uh, mealworms, again, you, uh, not quite as common as the other worms. Uh, this is generally, basically this is the larva of like flies. Um, they work really well in some cases. Um, and so we, uh, uh, we take these and uh, you can even find these at pet stores because they're often used to feed exotic animals and, and again, relatively inexpensive. Uh, the, these mealworms are really popular up here for, for fish like perch through the ice when we're ice fishing in January and February. Uh, your prepared cheese baits like power bait work really well. Um, the great thing about these, they keep a really long time if you make sure they're tightly sealed. Um, I've had I've had power bait last two and three years. They will dry out at some point, but compared to worms or mealworms or crickets or grasshoppers, they're really it's it's really much more convenient to use. Um, you don't have to go you know you don't have to go buy it on your way out. You can have it left over from the last trip. Comes in a variety of colors. Most of them float. So that if you are uh, if you are fishing with a bobber, you will need a, a small sinker to get it down below the surface. Otherwise, it will fall to the top. Um, and and it, but it, it works very well. Some of them are garlic scented uh, or other scents, and and that that helps. Um, if you look at them, this one says trout bait. Some will say some will say catfish. Some will say pan bait. That kind of stuff. And then again, I'm geared mostly towards a lot of our. I'm geared towards a lot of our uh, local fisheries uh, and trout fisheries, uh, processed salmon eggs work really well. One thing you have to realize when you go to different parts of, of the state or different waters, they all have different fishing regulations. And so like up here in Eastern Nevada, which includes Eureka, Lander, White Pine and Elko counties, you're not allowed to use any fish or fish parts except for processed salmon eggs. So you can use this kind of stuff, but you're not allowed to catch a fish, cut a piece off of it and use it for bait. It's illegal. So make sure you feed, read your fishing regulations, check it out and know what bait you have for the water you're going to. Um, obviously, take a set of fishing regulations is going to be your best friend. So you know where to go. There's also some great articles. You can see that uh, uh, one of our fisheries biologists wrote a great um, article on the art of small stream fishing, Nevada being the driest state in the country, averaging just a little over seven and a half inches of rain a year. Um, it's, it's and even obviously even less down in Southern Nevada, lots of really tiny little creeks. Uh, they hold some really cool fish. Um, and, and so you can fish those, but a lot of great informations like that. Uh, we often feature certain, you know, different waters and different years. And we put a new set of fishing regulations out every single year because laws do change. And so I recommend before you go to your favorite water each year, just take five minutes, grab a new set of fishing regs. You can get them up at uh, endow.org. Um, you can actually download them. And so, uh, in fact, I believe that we just put up a, a link to it, the eregulations.com Nevada slash fishing. And they change every year for, you know, for reasons. Sometimes limits change, sometimes uh, bait changes, dates obviously change, you know, um, as far as what days you can start and stop in some waters. So, so take a few minutes, read about your water. Um, and in fact, within each of the uh, fishing regulations, it's broken down into Western, Eastern, and Southern Nevada. And so you'll have general statewide regulations, know those, because they met they're, they're, they take place everywhere in the state of Nevada. But then if you're fishing in Southern Nevada, look at the Southern Nevada regulations. And within that Southern Nevada area, they'll actually list waters, what their limits of fish you can keep are, um, what kind of baits you can use. Maybe some of them have certain times of day. Like for example, if you go fish uh, Ruby Lake National Wildlife Refuge up here in Elko County, you're not allowed to fish uh, more than an hour after sunset or an hour before sunrise. Um, the, the, the refuge is closed during that time. So you can learn things like that. Under 12, guess what? Kids do not need a fishing license. It's awesome. Uh, they, they get to go fishing for free. Uh, 12 to 17, the junior fishing license is only $15. 
uh, very inexpensive. And then 18 and older, it's $40 for a resident fishing license. And this fishing license is good from the day you buy it for the next year. It expires on, on it expires the day before you bought it the following year. So the last day you can use it, if you buy it on, on say, uh, today is what, October 26th. If you buy it today, uh, the last day you can use it would be October 25th of 2021. So you get a full year out of it. Um, that was something we just changed a few years back. I think it's a really great change that we made. Used to be you had to get a trout stamp, a two rod stamp, all these little things you added on. Um, don't need that anymore. Um, in most places you can fish with two rods. Um, you don't need a trout stamp now where there's there's where you're fishing for trout. So it, it's just really easy. And, and you can buy these right online at www.endowlicensing.com. Very simple. Um, and if you have any, want any more information, uh, please feel free to contact me. My uh, email address is my first initial J, my last name is set at endow.org. Uh, direct line to my office is 775-777-2305. Um, the, uh, our website, which has lots of great information on it for, for fishing. Uh, we got stocking reports to see where we just stocked to, to maybe help you have a little more success. Uh, though generally the fish, if you give them a day to, to settle in, they'll, they, they generally, um, will take a, take your bait a little bit better. Uh, the second or third day they're in the water, the first day they're still kind of stressed, but it's a great way to find out where we just stocked fish and give your chance, kids a chance. We also have a fishable waters map, which you can access through there, and it'll show what waters in your area have what species of fish. So if you got kids, you obviously want to take them uh, where they can catch fish that are easy to catch, like bluegill or perch or crappie, uh, fish like that. Um, even small bass are a lot of fun for the kids. Kids don't care about how big the fish is. Um, they really uh, want to, uh, to just catch fish. So let's open it up to any questions. Um, it's not, uh, uh, like I said, if you think of some later on, I'll be more than happy. This is geared just towards the beginner. I, I know some of you out there probably have experienced fishing before, but but this is uh, uh, very, very simple to do. As a general rule, you can set yourself up for under $30 for a great day of fishing um, as far as for your gear, not counting your license. So if you got any questions, I'll take them now. And see here, I'm not seeing anything on the chat. Let's quit screen. Um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. Tonight is an is the Nevada Native Fish Slam. Uh, you can see where you can register there. Um, click that link in the chat box. Uh, it's really uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, it's a really a lot of fun. Um, it, the great thing about getting out and learning about that Native Fish Slam is that. You, uh, you get to see a lot of different parts of Nevada. Uh, Southern Nevada, because of the, the climate, um, doesn't have a lot of our native fish down there as far as part of that slam. But once you get out of uh, Clark County, you start getting into some and, and further north, uh, get up around Ely and north, you start getting into those waters. Uh, the native fish slam includes the uh, cut, uh, includes several species of cutthroat, Yellowstone, Bonneville, and Lahontan cutthroat trout. It includes inland red band rainbow trout, the bull trout, and the mountain whitefish. And what's really cool about where I live up in uh, uh, northern, up in Elko County in the very northeast corner of the state, you can get five of the six species right up here. Um, we're the only county you can do that in, uh, but it, but uh, um, you just get about 10 miles south of our county in, in the northern part of White Pine County. You can also get that last species you can't, which is the Bonneville Cuts. But you get to get some really cool country, uh, lots of fun. Uh, Chris Crookshanks is our, our native fish biologist, and he does a really killer job on that. So I encourage you to join that one tonight. Uh-oh. All right. Hi, Abby. Hi, just one more question. Um, at, towards the beginning, we had someone bring up crappie jigs. Is there any beginning lures or spinners like that that you would recommend? So, so crappie jigs are great for uh, panfish. Maybe tip it with a piece of worm. Um, personally, I prefer to get the little yellow rubber grubs or not yellow, it can be any color. They're short. They're, you know, generally about three inches long. 
Um, and they'll be, they come in white, chartreuse, fluorescent orange. Uh, then they have really cool colors like guacamole and motor oil. <laughs> and, and so these are a lot of fun. Um, they're really easy. Um, they've got like a, a twister tail. I should have brought one with me. They work really well for um, all species of fish. You can catch bass. And there you go. Abby's showing you one right there. Um, they work great on panfish. <laughs> I've caught trout with them. I've caught bass with them. Um, haven't caught a wiper with one yet, though. Haven't caught a wiper with or a striper with one. Uh, but but they and they they work really really well. Um, just basic rooster tails and spinners are very simple to use. Uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, and generally, I like dark colors with a, uh, a, a contrasting lighter color as dots on them or go with really bright, you know, like a silver or a gold with dark colored spots on that contrast seems to make a difference when they rooster tails are basically nothing more than a spinner with some feathers on the end of it. They work real well. Um, spoons for some species of fish are very simple. It's basically just a piece of metal shaped to look kind of like a spoon. And they, uh, um, they they just have a hook at the tailing end. They're generally, they're, a brand name that's real popular is called Daredevil. They're often in red and white, black and white, that kind of stuff. They're really good. Um, so, so basic stuff like that. When you start getting into bass um, and, and, and some of your other species, uh, some of those lures can get very, very expensive, uh, you know, five, 10 bucks a piece. And if you lose one or two, um, you know, that, that can make for an expensive night, expensive day of fishing. But, uh, you know, once you get into a lot, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. The other thing to remember, you can always dig up uh, worms out of your garden. I love grasshoppers. Um, if you can get your kids to catch a bunch of grasshoppers, put them in a, in a jar that has holes poked in the lid so they get air, um, put them on a really light wire hook, dead drift them suit. So, uh, on through really uh, small creeks and, and streams or even put them behind a bobber out on a on a pond and they start kicking um, fish just can't seem to resist that so so yeah uh, all different different types of things you can go online you can uh, go to your I like to go to a local sporting goods store and actually see what they have. And often the great thing about that is uh, the, the people that are working in the, the, the sporting goods department um, often are fishermen and they're very happy in most cases to share their knowledge with you, give you ideas of, of what is working. In fact, if you tell them where you're going, a lot of, a lot of places uh, like in Reno or or uh, Vegas, or even if you get up to Ely camping from Vegas or out from Reno, um, you know, you go to these small little towns, uh, you go to their, their small sporting goods stores or, or sporting goods departments. They are outdoorsmen and women. They love to fish. They love sharing their stuff. And you can get a lot of local information about what works on what waters. And even, hey, you know, this water's not fishing well right now, the one you were planning on going to, maybe you can go to one of the others. So that's a really good uh, good, good way to, to, to do that and to learn about some of those waters. And again, it's about getting out there. It's about the journey. It's a lot of fun. Some of my kids' best memories um, were fishing with me. Uh, my, my son and I did always get along in, uh, uh, in, when he was in high school, but we always got along when we were fishing. So, so that worked really well. And some of my best memories with my parents uh, were fishing. My, my dad was gone a lot. And my poor mother from New York City didn't know anything about fishing. And she'd go down and look for an old grandfatherly type person and sit down next to him. And of course, most of the time they would take pity on her and start helping us kids. And then uh, we still laugh about that when we, when we get together with my, my mom at, at dinners and stuff. So, so it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, you may not catch fish right away. Um, but get out. The only way to learn is to get out and do it and take advantage of somebody who knows the, how to do it and, uh, and pick their brains and, and guys, you know, people will even take you along. Some fishermen, fisherwomen, they'd love to take you along. And then once uh, some of this stuff is over, uh, I know before COVID, we did hands-on fishing clinics. And hopefully in the future, when things settle down, uh, we'll be able to do some of our hands-on clinics again. That's that's a ways down the road, but those clinics are free. And so it's a great way to, to try, try it out. Other questions? Okay, there's an exit survey at the end. 
Um, really appreciate everybody uh, joining us tonight. Um, please take that exit survey. Uh, what it does, it allows us to improve these in the future, uh, maybe find out something we did that uh, maybe didn't work as well, or something we didn't do that you wanted to learn about. And so if you take that exit survey, um, tell your friends about it. We've got uh, three more days of this. Um, tomorrow, we have three o'clock and 4.30 uh, sessions that are geared towards after school for the children. Tomorrow night, I'm actually doing a presentation on fishing northeastern Nevada. And so we'd love to have you join us for that. Um, and then, of course, Wednesday and Thursday, we have other things coming along. Um, we'll have Ask a Biologist. We've got Fish Dissection. Uh, go ahead. Go check out our Facebook page um, Check and, and see what we got up there. And, and we'd love to have you back for some of those other events. Uh, thank you all very much. And if there are no further questions, uh, we're good to go. And uh, I hope to see some of you on the water sometime.